his crucifixion and resurrection will happen. So this is the winter time before that. So Jesus takes his disciples, his apostles north with him, to the far northern reaches of where the kingdom of Israel was. And as they approach Caesarea Philippi, and they see this sight of this city on a hill that was to be created as a monument to Philip, with all of the stone gods all along the walls, with all of the temples and the gates of Hades right there, this is where Jesus is with his disciples. When he says to them, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now what we need to understand is Jesus has been using this title, Son of Man, in reference to himself often throughout the Gospels. And the Son of Man title is one that comes from the prophet Isaiah where he talks about the Son of Man, one who comes like a Son of Man and a character that is a specific individual, the Son of Man, one who will come and bear the iniquity of the world, one who will come and bear the sin of humankind, one who will be crushed, but one who will be raised up by God and who will come on the heavens and who will come and judge all humanity. And so Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Meaning himself. And they respond. Some say John the Baptist. That's not uncommon. Herod Antipas, son of Herod that tried to kill Jesus, who had John the Baptist killed, believed and even sent people out to ask, who is this Jesus character? Is this John the Baptist come from the grave. Others, Elijah, that's part of what the Hebrew people would have been expecting, that Elijah, having been taken up into heaven, would be coming back down to earth in order to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. Uh, still others, Jeremiah, or others, some of the great prophets. And this whole idea of expectation here is that some people look at Jesus as a good prophet, a good teacher. And what they're hearing and what they're seeing is just someone who is helping to prepare the way for the Messiah. But Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? Now, the you in there in the Greek is plural. So I'm going to translate it into my own language. Who do y'all say that I am? <laughs> Who do y'all say that I am? And the interesting thing on this is the I am. Ego, a me. Uh, that is the Greek translation for the name Yahweh, God of the Old Testament. I am that I am. So Jesus is not only asking them, who do you say, who do you all say that I am Jesus? Who do you confess with your life? Who do you say that I am Yahweh is? Who do you say that God is? Who do you in your life, who do you in your words, who do you in your actions say that I am? He's asking two questions. And Simon Peter answers, bold as he is. You are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. Christos in the Greek, literally smudged one in the Aramaic, because the smudged slash anointed one is the one that is set aside for a specific purpose by God. Prophets were anointed. Kings that were in the Davidic line were anointed. They were anointed, set apart by God, called Messiah, smudged one, and given a specific purpose. But when he says the Messiah, not a Messiah, we're talking about something completely different. We're talking about the 
Messiah, the one that all of Israel, the one that all of the world has been waiting for, who is going to come and set things straight. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, if you can just imagine this scene, Simon is standing before this pantheon of Roman gods, giant temples constructed to all of these Roman gods, these statues everywhere. He is saying to Jesus, you are the Son of the living God. None of these other ones are living. All that Philip has spent these last 30 years building these temples towards and everything else like that, that's all dead. You are the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Basically saying, Simon, you've done your dad proud. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And that tells us, brothers and sisters in Christ, that, that frees us. That is a freeing statement, I think. Because by our own will, by our own flesh and blood, by our own striving, we can't come to approach God. It is God the Father who sends His Son. It is God who sends His Spirit. It is God who comes to us. It is God through that Holy Spirit that wells up faith within us. So it's not dependent on me. It's not dependent on Peter there. It is a blessing that comes from God to Peter. And I tell you, you are Peter. Petros, which literally means rock. And I tell you, you are rock. And on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, remember where they are. They're standing there. There's the giant rock wall. There's the gates of Hades right in front of them. Will not prevail against it. And there's so much that is packed within this. Here we have all of these Roman and Greek deities. Here we have all of these 48 temples carved out of the stone and the rock. Here we have everything that Philip has built in this city, right up high there, all of the stone and everything else like that. And there is Jesus looking at Peter and saying, you're the rock. You, flesh and blood, Peter, you are the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And I love the word that Jesus uses for church. It's not a building. It's not a place. It's not four walls. Church is ecclesia, literally meaning the people called out of the world. People called out and gathered together. It has nothing to do with four walls. It has nothing to do with all of this grandeur and rock in front of you. The real rock of the church is every single person sitting in the pews this evening. That is the rock upon which the church is built. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it or against you. Jesus tells Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this has been dealt with and talked about in many different ways throughout all of Christian history. But the one consistent way that we have talked about this, and the one consistent way that I want to impress upon you is that you individually, have been given the gift of the gospel message. And that is the most important thing that you have. That is the most important thing that you can give to any other human being. Because in that message is life. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the gospel is life-giving. 
If you refuse to give another human being life, you have bound them. But if you are gracious in sharing the Word of God, in sharing your faith story, in sharing what God has done, continues to do, and promises yet to do with you, then you are loosening and freeing people's lives and bringing life into them. There is a, a, a great, there is a great quote from the most recent Star Wars movie, Rogue One. Rebellions are built on hope. Think about it. Here we have 13 people staring at this giant city that was created by Philip. With all of the power in the world that he has and all of the tyrants in the world surrounding them. And in the midst of that, Jesus is telling them that I'm going to give you that is something so powerful that it takes away sin, takes away evil, that it defeats death, that the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, that is a promise of light and life eternal. See, tyrants, the only power that they have is the power to inflict pain and the power to kill. And as soon as Jesus gives this tremendous power of the gospel to the disciples, and as soon as the disciples start to tell people, look, the tyrant may kill you, but God is going to give you eternal life. Rebellions are built on hope, my friends. And in just a few short hundred years, that 13, those 13 apostles have spread the word and have spread the gospel around all of the Roman Empire and past its boundaries all the way out even into the British Isles. What a fire that was lit as the gospel is given to those disciples that day. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, you have a tremendous gift. You have the keys to the kingdom. And when you choose to share your gospel message with someone else, you are unlocking the door of life for them. But if you choose to withhold that, you're locking them in to sin. You're locking them into death. You're locking them into darkness. You're locking them into hopelessness. Whatever you loose, you loose to heaven. Whatever you bind, you bound in heaven. Now Jesus, at the end of this moment, sternly tells them, tell no one I'm going to sign. Why is that? It's oftentimes called by people who study this, the messianic secret. While the disciples, while Peter confessed, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, they still didn't know who Jesus fully was. Crucifixion and the resurrection has yet to happen. And so Jesus is like, all right, I know you're all excited, but hold on for just a little bit. Because right then, starting from the base of Mount Hermon, he is going down to Jerusalem to finalize what he is about on earth. Now, after the resurrection, Paul writes in Romans, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What I want you to understand is to present is a continually active verb. It is not a single one-time thing. The, the Greek translation is best in English 
to continually present yourself, the entirety of your being, because it's not just body, not just my flesh, it is the entirety of my being. Everything that Chris Conklin is, is to be presented to God every single hour, every single minute, not just for an hour at church. It is what my proper work is to do. So by the mercies of God, continually, people, present yourselves, everything that you are, every atom of your being, as a living sacrifice. Not like a dead sacrifice that is tossed into the pit of Hades, but a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable God to God, which is your spiritual worship. I don't like the way the English translators did this. Because the actual Greek word means it is the reasonable thing that you should do. So, holy and present, continually present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is the reasonable thing for you to do. It is the absolutely reasonable thing for you to do. You were in sin. You were dead. You were bound by evil. You were in darkness, and God gave you new life, eternal life, freedom from sin, forgiveness. It is reasonable, then, to expect you, and that we should, give ourselves daily in service of God. It is the reasonable thing to do. Do not be conformed to this world, Paul writes, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Remember the word that Jesus used for church, the called out people of this world. If the world is infected by evil and death, Jesus wants to call out these people, give them, breathe into them new life, give them the word and the gospel message so that they can be the people who are not conformed to the world, but helping in transforming the world. And transform, the Greek word that's there is the word that we have made in English as metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, like when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. In the same way, before we knew God, we were dead, captive to sin. We were in darkness. And we have been transformed by the power of God into something that is different. People who live in the light. And in that, our task is to constantly renew our minds and be reminded that we are in the world, but not of the world. So that we can discern what is the world. What is good? What is acceptable? And what is perfect? And that is the spiritual discipline that we're to be about. Spending time in Scripture, Spending time being held accountable with each other. Spending that important time with brothers and sisters in Christ so that our minds are constantly being renewed and tuned into that which is the will of God. And Paul continues to go on by saying, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. He's telling you butterflies to remember that you were once caterpillars too. Amen. Not that you ever want to go back. I think of when I when I look at this verse and I'm reminded by that verse, I, I kind of remember how many of you have ever been to a high school reunion? Yeah? A, a good portion of that. You know, going to the high school reunion was pretty scary for me. I don't want to be reminded of what I was like in high school. 
I mean, I probably I wore the ugliest clothes. I had a mullet, you know, business in the front, all party in the back, long hair. We wore neon clothes. We don't want to be reminded of what we once were. And we don't ever want to go back to that. But Paul seeks to remind us, and God seeks to remind us, that you were once caterpillars. You were once in high school. You were once dead. You were once bound and captive to sin. You were once people who did not know God. But you do now. But there's so many people who don't. So don't pretend that you're any better than them. Because, again, our gospel lesson, it's not by your own work. It's not through flesh and blood, Jesus is telling Peter and telling us. It's not through your own work that you came to know God, that you came to achieve salvation or anything else like that, but by the work of God, by your Father in heaven. So he challenges us to think with sober judgment. And he reminds us that we are one body. We have many members and not all the members have the same function. Take a look around. We're all different. We've even got Navy folks in here. <laughs> We're all different. Some of us have hair. Some of us have less hair. Some of us have different skills and abilities. We've all been created differently and we're all important and we're all equal in the body of Christ. That is absolute antithesis to the world that Philip was trying to create. Philip was trying to create a world where the rich have everything and continue to give it to each other where they're the only ones that matter, and where they worship after these false gods and continue to oppress each other, continue to live by the tyrant's rules. Yet in the world of the church, the called out people of God, it doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter who your parents were, doesn't matter what part of the world you're from. Doesn't matter necessarily at all your educational level. Certainly doesn't matter whether you have a gold card or a platinum card. Your bank account doesn't matter on Judgment Day. My brothers and sisters in Christ, all of us are equal in the church. We all have gifts that differ according to their race. Some of us are given the gift of prophecy. Some of us are given the gift of ministry. Some of us are great teachers. Some of us exhort each other. Some of us give generously. Some of us are leaders. And some of us are more compassionate. That is the great gifts that we have. And so, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as we start to close for this evening, I want us to remember that the church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is the people. You are the solid rock upon which the church is built. Each and every single one of you, each and every single one of you has a gospel message that unlocks life for other people. That gospel message, while it is indeed that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Each of us tell it in a different way because God has acted in our lives in a unique and different way. God has changed you from a caterpillar to a butterfly, but all of us are different types of butterflies. And the best way for me to share the gospel message with someone else in my life is to tell them how has God impacted my life individually? And as you do that, you unlock heaven for them. As you open the Gospels to them, you are handing them life eternal. You are handing them forgiveness in a world that doesn't forgive much. You're handing them light in the midst of darkness. 
my brothers and sisters of Christ. What a great gift that God has given to you. Ministers. Rocks of the church. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that it's not us. We thank you that you, Lord, inspire us. That you teach us. That you build up faith within us. That by your Holy Spirit, we are able to confess your Son as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Lord, help us to be strong in that faith. Help us to be solid rocks in that faith. Help us to carry that faith forward in the things that we do and the things that we say. Help us to offer ourselves continuously every single day as a living sacrifice to you. And in that, Lord, help us to speak into the lives of those who do not know you. Those who are lost in this world, who are living in a land of great darkness, who think that when death comes for them, that that is the end, who know nothing of forgiveness, who know nothing of hope, whose lives are bound in the slavery of this world. Lord, use us to bring the freedom of the gospel the light of your Son, the peace that passes all understanding, the hope that comes with reliance on you and faith in you. Use us, Lord, to be your church, the called out people of this world, each and every single day. I pray for these things through your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Got a few announcements for this week. A reminder, Tuesday's Bible study, 5.45 in the morning, here. Next slide. Wednesday, we gather together at 6 o'clock in this space right here uh, for intercessory prayer, where we lift up the praises and prayer requests of this community and also those others as we gather around here. Uh, sometimes there's four, sometimes there's 12. We'd like to see even more. Uh, Bible study immediately following that at 6.30 goes to about 7.30. If you want to stick around, there are those that come and participate and learn uh, conversational English. Your faith might just rub off on them. That's a good thing. On Thursday night, we always have a movie in here. There's popcorn, there's pizza, uh, just a time to get together and hang out on Thursday nights in here. And... Friday and Saturday. If you can make a noise, the choir will teach you how to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And that's a good thing also. So come and join uh, the choir choir practice at 6.30 on Friday and Saturday. Saturday night, there's Bible study for men at 7 o'clock. And a reminder, there's Padre PT, led by our own Padre Choi. Uh, at uh, 3.30 Monday through Friday at the prison gym, as we call it. Sunday at 5. It's the seven deadly sins, seven exercises, seven rounds, seven reps each with uh, a run in between. And I like to say by the end, you're either going to be praising God that it's over or praying to God that it will soon be over. It's going to make you pray either way. Yes? Next Sunday morning will be uh, Chaplain George's last uh, time to present the gospel. I'm not there until Sunday morning service. I encourage you to come out and do it. So uh, Troy is going to be uh, heading back to Australia and his family. And like you said, next Sunday is the last time that he is preaching. It's going to be at 1030 service that happens in here. Uh, I plan on, on, on showing up for the very beginning before I have to go over and do another service on the other side of the base. Uh, to, to thank him and to thank him for his friendship and his leadership of our community as well. 
Uh, so please, you know, double dip. Come to two sermons and two services that Sunday. It'll, it'll go better for you. It'll, it'll build up a whole lot more Holy Spirit inside of you there at that time. Any other announcements? All right, let's stand and receive the Lord's benediction. And now may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the God of all grace bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thank you.